the latest twist in the will they, won't they story that everyone is talking about. Elon Musk and Twitter. It's the hottest and messiest relationship drama this side of Riverdale, and it looks like after weeks of flirtation and fighting, the new couple has officially done the deed. Now it is official, Elon Musk has bought Twitter for approximately 44 billion. He's gonna be paying each share of Twitter $54.20. In a statement released by the company, Mr. Musk said, free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. This is a dramatic turn of events from earlier this month when Twitter was set to decline Musk's offer, adopting a so-called poison pill to block him. That's right, people. Twitter said it would never sell to Elon Musk, and then he produced the cash, and they're like, all right, we'll sell. <laughs> yes, I guess they found that edit button after all. <laughs> It's actually kind of a historic moment. This is the first time anyone at Twitter has changed their mind about anything. Well done. <laughs> I feel like Twitter was always gonna sell to Elon though, right? They just couldn't be too eager about it. You know, it's like a, like a husband and a wife where it's like, uh-uh, oh, I am not going to that wedding. Forget it, it's not gonna happen. And then three months later, it's like, how does my bow tie look? How does it, <laughs> do you think it looks good? Do you think it does? I honestly don't know why Elon would wanna own Twitter, right? It just doesn't seem like a fun place to supervise right now. You know, it's like buying Jurassic Park after the power went down and the cages are opened. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna spend a lot of time replacing Jeep windshields. That's all I'm saying. But the truth is, look, in many ways, this is a really smart move by Elon Musk because wealthy men know the value in owning publishing platforms. Yeah, it's why Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. It's why Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal. It's why Confucius owns those fortune cookies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you see, then he knows that none of us will play his lucky numbers in the lotto. That's genius. So you see, by buying Twitter, Elon Musk gets to own one of the most culturally influential publishing platforms in the world. I mean, remember this, think about it. Twitter is how the Arab Spring took off, right? Black Lives Matter blew up on Twitter. The Me Too movement started on Twitter. Trump used Twitter to turn himself from a reality show joke into the 45th president of the United States and a joke. <laughs> so owning Twitter gives you more power than the drugstore employee with the key to the deodorant shelf, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wanna smell fresh, you best not piss off Curtis. Don't play around. <laughs> I'll shut you down, walk around smelling musty. So here's the thing, look, whether you are for Elon Musk or against him, you've gotta admit, it is pretty crazy that one man is now in control of all of that. Because before this, Jack Dorsey didn't own Twitter. A lot of people think he did. No, he had 2% of the shares. And even as CEO, he still had to answer to the board. And the board still had to answer to the shareholders. And Twitter itself still had to answer to the SEC. But now as a private company, it's just Elon Musk. Yeah, everything that happens on Twitter from now on is up to him and also whatever strain his weed guy gives him that day. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he gets the wrong sativa, there could be a race war, people. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> like, this is the thing. Whether it's a billionaire you like or a billionaire you hate, as a society, I think we should spend more time interrogating how easy it is for billionaires to shape our world in their favor. Just think about it. You like it now, you don't like it now, but should they be able to do it? I don't know. But let's move on from Twitter to a real battlefield, the invasion of Ukraine. Since before the invasion began, the United States has tried to put pressure on Russia using economic sanctions, which is basically taking away your allowance, but for countries. And the US government has cast a wide net. It's gone after Russian officials, uh, oligarchs, companies, banks, and of course, Vladimir Putin himself. But it turns out there's one high profile Russian who has somehow avoided becoming a target. A new report explains why the US has so far refused to sanction Vladimir Putin's girlfriend and the mother, allegedly, of his three, or three of his children. The US government has considered, but then pulled back on, sanctioning a woman long rumored to be Putin's girlfriend, the Russian gymnast, Alina Kabeva. This is something that uh, was deemed so sensitive that they decided to hold off because they believed that Putin's uh, response could be so irrational, so angry, um, that there would be some sort of backlash. Wow, this is interesting. Well, the U.S. government has sanctioned everyone except Putin's girlfriend. I guess they watched the Oscars and they were like, ooh, maybe we should stay away from spouses. <laughs> just uh, play it safe. And, and, and before we get into the sanctions or not sanctions, am I the only person who's shocked that Vladimir Putin has a girlfriend? Am I the only one? <laughs> like, 
if there's any man out there who has some red flags, girl, let me tell you about Vlad. <laughs> yeah, I know some people like a bad boy, but this is next level. Like there's bad and then there's genocide, okay? Also, Putin must be relieved that the US is not sanctioning his girlfriend, because let's be honest, sanctions take a relationship to a whole new level. You know, that puts a lot of pressure on the relationship. Yeah, I always tell my friends, sanctions in a relationship, whoa, oh yeah, it's a lot of pressure, mm -mm. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Putin was relieved. You know, he can't have America being more serious about his relationship than he is. <laughs> Can you imagine how pissed his girlfriend would be? He's just like, Vladdy, how come America treat me like your wife, but you still will not let me keep toothbrush at Kremlin, huh? <laughs> ti što, Vlad, ti što? A little over a year ago, thousands of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building in an attempt to stop the election from being certified. And they wanted to declare Donald Trump super president forever, no backseas. <laughs> now, what was surprising is that by and large, the Republican party has decided not to hold any of that against Donald Trump. And I mean, let's be honest, how can you stay mad at this face? How could you stay mad at this face? Yeah, 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 yeah. But the Capitol riots wasn't even the scariest thing that happened on January 6th. Because you see, my friends, we're now finding out that something else happened that day. Countless Republicans seem to have had their memories erased. I, I know it sounds crazy, but, <laughs> but okay, look at what happened to Kevin McCarthy, the leader of the House Republicans and guy who has definitely called rap music the hippity hop. <laughs> He's one of Trump's firmest supporters, never wavered in public even after January 6th. So when the New York Times reported that McCarthy had privately told colleagues that he thought Trump should resign, he denied it fiercely. He had no memory of saying anything like that. And then the tapes dropped. I, I've, I've had it with this guy. Uh, what he did is unacceptable. Um, nobody can defend that and nobody should defend it. And then, I mean, the only discussion I would have with him is that it would be my recommendation we should resign. It is my recommendation that he should resign, but yet McCarthy's memory of that call was completely wiped. <laughs> yeah, on January 10th, he was all, I've had it with this guy. And then two weeks later, he was chilling at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, dude quit Trump the way most of us quit Twitter. <laughs> he was like, I'm deleting this app. Actually, I'm not gonna delete it, but I won't check it again until right now. Tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> Did you miss me? And by the way, a lot of people were wondering if getting caught on tape slamming Donald Trump would be the end of Kevin McCarthy's political career. I mean, this is Trump's party. You know, if Trump comes out against him, that's it, it's over. All it takes is one crying Kevin betrayed me and it's done. <laughs> but instead, Trump came out and said he and McCarthy are fine. In fact, he said, I think it's all a big compliment. Frankly, they realized they were wrong and supported me. <laughs> yeah, you see, Trump loves this stuff. In fact, if you used to be against him and now you're not, he likes those people more than someone who loved him the whole time because it shows that he made you bend the knee. Yeah, the dude loves converting people more than Scientologists and vegans combined. <laughs> Let me tell you something now. If Hillary Clinton herself came out right now as pro-Trump, I don't care what anyone says. Let me tell you right now, she would be his new favorite person. He'd be like, do we love crooked Hillary folks? Do we love her? Let her out, let her out, let her out. So good, so good. I love her, I love her. She was so cheeky, used to be cheeky. So yeah, Kevin McCarthy completely forgot what he said on and around January 6th, but it's not just him. Take Rick Perry, Trump's energy secretary. A few months ago, CNN reported that Perry was the author of a text message laying out a plan for overturning the election. And Perry said, absolutely not, it never happened. But then today, CNN got hold of the complete message and it's actually signed, Rick Perry. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's worse. The fact that he was part of an insurrection or the fact that he signed his text message. <laughs> That's such an old person thing to do. <laughs> it's worse than when my grandfather bought a bigger TV because he thought it would fit more channels in it. <laughs> so look, obviously something happened to Rick's memory too. 
But as worried as I am for those guys, people, I am really concerned about Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> Congresswoman from Georgia and soccer mom who's definitely slashed the other team's bus tires. <laughs> you see, a few of MTG's constituents have filed a lawsuit to disqualify her from Congress based on her role in January 6th. Yeah, apparently, there's something in the Constitution that says you can't run for office if you do an insurrection against the government. Yeah, you know how people had crazy ideas back then. Yeah. <laughs> And now, look, we all know it's probably not gonna work, but Marjorie Taylor Greene was still forced to testify at a hearing on Friday, and it looks like nobody has been hit harder by January 6th amnesia than her. You didn't talk to anybody in government about the fact that there were gonna be large protests in Washington on January 6th. I don't remember. You spoke to Representative Biggs or his staff about that fact, didn't you? I do not remember. How about Representative Gosar? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Did anyone ever mention to you the possibility that there might be violence in Washington? I don't remember. Ms. Green, this is a tweet that you sent out uh, on January 2nd, 2021, correct? I'm not sure. Okay, you don't recall this? I, I don't okay. recall tweeting that, no. Did you advocate to President Trump to impose martial law as a way to remain in power? I don't recall. You don't recall if you wanted to impose martial law? <laughs> you don't, wow! I wish I had Marjorie Taylor Greene's memory. Yeah, I once said, enjoy your dinner to a waiter in 2003. <laughs> and I still think about it every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> enjoy your dinner, you enjoy your dinner, kill me! Meanwhile, she can't even remember if she told the president to impose martial law. Yo, 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 let me tell you something. That should be an easy one for most people. If you ever asked the president to impose martial law, you would never forget something that specific. Like, if anyone can't say no to doing something that specific and weird, you definitely did that shit. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, have I ever tried to steal a horse and uh, ride it inside a bouncy castle. Um, <laughs> Your Honor, I do not recall. Um, <laughs> but you gotta admit, that sounds like something a pretty cool guy would do, right? <laughs> right, members of the jury, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if it's not cool, then I do not recall. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> so, Marjorie Taylor Greene spent the entire hearing denying that she had any memory of anything to do with January 6th. But it turns out, my friends, that there may be a cure to this amnesia because one thing that can bring it back, even if just for a little bit, is evidence. And in another moment, Taylor Greene first denied that she had called House Speaker Nancy Pelosi a traitor to her country before kind of hedging a little bit when faced with actual evidence of saying it. In fact, you think that Speaker Pelosi is a traitor to the country, right? Uh, you're, I'm not answering that question. It's speculation. You, it's you've, you've said that, haven't you, Ms. Green, that she's a traitor to the country? No, I haven't said that. Okay. Put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 5, please. Which oh, no, wait. Hold on now. Oh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. No, now that you busted me, I remember the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, I remember it now. I love that move. Yes, that's, that's when you tell your mom, yeah, I did my homework, and she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, let me show it to me, and you're like, oh, homework! <laughs> yeah, I thought you meant my work at home. Um, I'll do that now, thank you, mom, for reminding me. I, uh, yeah, no, thank you so much for that. Look, man, I mean, clearly this person is unqualified for Congress, right? because politicians are supposed to be good at lying, okay? <laughs> this was just embarrassing. Okay, in my defense, I didn't know you had evidence. I mean, I never have evidence for the stuff I say. I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. <laughs> Keep in mind, people, this stuff only happened a little over a year ago. It's not like they're being asked to remember their prom date's eye color. These aren't trick questions. But nobody in the Republican Party can seem to remember planning the insurrection or talking about it or even how they felt about it at the time. Kevin McCarthy, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Jim Jordan, the list goes on and on. When it comes to the events surrounding that day, it's almost like it's been erased from their memories, which is obviously ridiculous, unless 
on the next season of Severance. Did you talk to the White House about trying to overturn the election? I do not remember. It's one thing to forget work. Governor, to see McCarthy simply doesn't remember what he said about Mr. Trump's culpability. I'm not sure what call you're talking about. Jim Jordan can't seem to remember when he talked to Trump on January 6th. I don't know if I spoke with him in the morning or not. I, I just don't know when those conversations happened. But, uh, but what if an entire political party couldn't remember January 6th? Did you talk with other congressmen about overturning the election? I have no idea. That's a perfect score. Sometimes it's just easier to forget. Hello. Coming to Apple TV Plus this fall. The continuing saga of Twitter and Elon Musk, right? Yesterday, the Tesla CEO and man who has definitely made love to a robot <laughs> officially purchased Twitter, setting off a wave of takes so hot they burned off my eyebrows and I had to draw them back on. Everyone was going crazy. Twitter is over. Twitter is back. Twitter killed Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> but one of the biggest takes came from former Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey, who gave Musk his stamp of approval saying, I trust his mission to extend the lights of consciousness. <laughs> And I'll be honest, people, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah? But Jack's clearly on that billionaire speak, yeah. No, I feel like after you reach a certain net worth, you just start talking like a stoned Jedi, you know? <laughs> it's like, what do I want for lunch? My hunger cannot be satiated, for I crave justice. <laughs> so, turkey sandwich, yeah, turkey sandwich? But all jokes aside, Jack Dorsey is a great guy, and I wish him a safe journey back to his home planet. Um, <laughs> but not everyone is as chill. Yeah, a lot of Twitter users flat out said that they're gonna leave the site. That's how much they hate the idea of Elon Musk owning it. To which Elon replied, I hope that even my worst critics remain on Twitter because that is what free speech means. Yeah, it was really beautiful. And I hope, I hope that he means that, I really do. I mean, but don't forget, this is a guy who once personally canceled a blogger's Tesla order because of something they wrote about him. So I'm just saying, yeah, you know, he has nice intentions, but when you have the power to be petty on an epic scale, the temptation to do it can be really hard to resist. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even blame him. I think it will happen to him. Like if I bought Google, if I bought Google, you best believe I would abuse those autofills. Yeah, <laughs> especially, especially around like Emmy voting season. You'd be like John Oliver, be like children's wig collector. <laughs> Stephen Colbert, hit and run. <laughs> Trevor Noah saves puppies. Hey! Uh, how did that happen? Me? No, oh, guys, no, oh. I just, yeah. I just had to, because Stephen Kobe hit the owner and then I had to, you know, just one of those things. But of course, the person everyone was waiting to hear from was the former king of Twitter, who would still be the king if the throne hadn't been stolen from him. I'm talking about Donald Jetski Trump. <laughs> you see, after getting kicked off of Twitter, Trump started his own service called Truth Social. But now that Elon owns Twitter, everyone wants to know if Trump will come back. And yesterday, the Tangerine Dream responded. Someone not on Twitter, Donald Trump. A little over a year ago, the former president was banned from the site, but even with new ownership, Trump told Fox News he will not rejoin and instead stick with his own social media platform. I am not going on Twitter. I am going to stay on truth. I hope Elon buys Twitter because he'll make improvements to it and he is a good man, but I am going to be staying on truth. President Trump this weekend, Saturday night at his rally touting his social media platform Truth Social and its plans to take on big tech censorship. Because of this digital tyranny, we had to give the American people their voice back by building something called Truth, Truth Central. <laughs> Truth Social. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Did this guy just call Truth Social Truth Central? What was that? <laughs> My man, you had one job, one job. It's your social media platform and you messed up the name? It's almost like every time Trump speaks, his own mouth stages an insurrection. That's what happens inside there. But yeah, Trump insists that he is not going back to Twitter 
He's going to stick with Troop SoCal, which um, so far has been a total bust. Apparently, the app only has 500,000 daily users. And to put it in perspective, Twitter, the thing that it's supposed to be replacing, has 217 million daily users. Yeah. So Truth Social is competition for Twitter, the same way that guy on the plane was competition for Mike Tyson. <laughs> also, it doesn't bode well that Trump himself has only posted on Truth Social one time, ever. Yeah, and that was two months ago. Think about how crazy that is. People, when he was on Twitter, Trump would send out like, what, 50 tweets every time he went to the bathroom, but now he hasn't posted in two months? I'm just saying, man, someone needs to get this guy some prune juice, stat. <laughs> He's in trouble. Now, apparently, th this has been an interesting part of the story. Apparently, a lot of Republicans are secretly thrilled if Trump would never come back to Twitter. Yeah, because they don't like the drama that he would create. And, and, and it makes sense. Do you remember? Do you remember what it was like when he was on Twitter, All right? He would say something. He'd tweet something random like, Congress should make it illegal to speak Spanish. And then all day, reporters would be tracking down Republican senators in the hallway. Remember, they'd chase them. They'd be like, do you agree with the president that it should be illegal to speak Spanish? And then the senators would have to come up with new ways to answer without answering, you know? Because you know, always those weird press conferences. Remember, they, they had to evade the questions without angering Trump. It was always them in the hallways just being like inundated. Like the people would be like, uh, um, did, did I see what, what the president tweeted? Well, I, I have seen Twitter as a company and I have seen the president as well. I, I, and I would love to comment on this particular tweet, but I'm about to eat this shrimp, which will give me a severe allergic reaction. Mm, mm. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm dying. I'm dying. Throat closing up. Thank you very much. No more comments. I'll be honest, though. The only reason I would want Trump back on Twitter, the only reason, is because I know, yes, it would probably lead to another term and it would destroy the country, but I just, I just really want to see his Wordle scores. <laughs> To see him, to see him every day being like, how could trunk shake child not be a word? I use it all the time. As you know, it has been nine weeks now since Vladimir Putin decided the best way to improve his international standing was to gently slide not into Ukraine's DMs, but into the entire Eastern region. <laughs> and since then, the whole world has been trying to figure out what to do. How do you respond to a madman who has nuclear weapons in his back pockets? And the world tried everything. Tried sanctions, tried cutting off Putin from international trade, tried blocking his PlayStation profile so he couldn't play Fortnite. <laughs> and now, finally, some countries have taken it to the next level, with Germany sending tanks to Ukraine. Yeah, which the Russians have called a major escalation. And I'll be honest, I agree with Russia on that. It is an escalation. You know, whenever German tanks show up to anything, <laughs> Shit's about to escalate. <laughs> German tanks never show up and people are like, ah, all right, it's chilled now. <laughs> yeah, you know what it's like? It's like when a black woman takes off her earrings. <laughs> There's no way things are cooling down from there. Whatever you did wrong, you about to pay. <laughs> but Russia is also doing their own escalations by turning off some of Europe's heat. Overnight, a drastic move. Russia cutting all gas deliveries to Bulgaria and Poland to NATO members. This comes after Putin's ultimatum last month, demanding that, quote, unfriendly nations pay for gas in Russian rubles. Poland's prime minister not backing down, saying we will be able to protect our economy, protect our households, and polls against such a dramatic step by Russia. Bulgarian officials say they are working with state gas companies on alternative sources, while Poland says it has been working for years to reduce its reliance on Russian gas and there wouldn't be a shortage of gas in Polish homes. Ooh, things are getting tense. <laughs> yeah, Russia says no more gas for Poland and Bulgaria. And in response, Poland and Bulgaria are like, screw you, we don't need your gas. We have our own. And then just to prove the point, Poland and Bulgaria posted selfies of themselves surrounded by gas. Yeah, <laughs> classic breakup behavior. But this is the thing that's gonna suck for Russia. Their main leverage is that their gas provides Europe's heat. But as the months get warmer, their negotiating power goes down. You know, it's the same way your gym teacher has all the power over you to make push-ups, like what you're gonna do during the school year, but let him meet you over the summer vacation, and all of a sudden it's like, you have no power here, Mr. Papadopoulos. <laughs> Why don't you do push-ups, <laughs> bitch? <laughs> He's like, I'll see you in September, but I'm here now. <laughs> So you know what, good for Poland and Bulgaria because most European countries are still buying Putin's gas. Yeah, many of them say they can't help it, which you have to admit is a little weird. 
you know? It's like if the people of Gotham were obsessed with the Joker's taco truck, you know? She's like, look, I mean, this guy is definitely a supervillain, but have you tried his El Pastor? I mean, <laughs> it is amazing. And here's the thing, so this is, this is the thing, the underlying issue is a little more complicated than gas or no gas, right? What happens is Russia wants to be paid for its gas in rubles, right, the Russian currency, because that way European countries have to keep buying rubles, which keeps the currency alive. So I understand why Russia is so mad at getting paid in a currency that they don't want, you know? Like, have you ever gotten a gift from like your little nephew that's like a coupon for one free hug? Yeah, I don't want that shit. I want cold, hard cash, Timmy. <laughs> Hugs are always free. Are you stupid? <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Timmy pisses me off, man. <laughs> For years, flight attendants in America have complained about, well, two things. Uh, one, idiots who press the call button when they meant to turn on the lights. And two, <laughs> the way they get paid. Well, now, finally, Delta Airlines is taking care of one of those issues. Flight attendants with Delta will soon be getting paid a little bit more money. The airline says it'll now start paying cabin crews during boarding. Up until now, flight attendants did not start getting paid until the passengers were seated and the plane's doors closed. That was the moment that their pay started. Delta says the change will start June 2nd as the company faces the possibility of its more than 20,000 flight attendants forming their own union. The change could increase some attendants' wages by several thousand dollars every year. Yeah, believe it or not, flight attendants in America do not get paid during the boarding process, which is crazy. Just think about it, you're at work, doing work, but your boss is like, nah, this is your free time. <laughs> <laughs> what, I only pay you when the doors are closed? That's wild. It also sucks for flight attendants on Spirit Airlines, because they don't even have doors, what do they do? <laughs> do they work for free? <laughs> How does that shit work? Because here's the thing, people, the boarding process is not easy. If anything, they should be getting paid extra for that part. You've gotta deal with passengers who suddenly don't know how numbers work. Does 23 come before 24? And what number is J? <laughs> and then on top of that, they have to deal with our bags that never fit. Yeah, and by the way, can I ask you, why do the bags never fit? <laughs> no, honest question, why do they never, it's called an overhead bag. Right? But it doesn't fit into the overhead. Why do they call it that? They shouldn't be allowed to sell it to you and call an overhead bag when it won't fit in the overhead because now I'm the idiot blocking the traffic and then, like everyone's looking at me, no one's getting paid. And I'm like, I swear, the store said it would fit in the overhead. There's none of them. They're like, you're an idiot. I'm not an idiot, it's overhead bag, but there's none of them don't call it in the overhead. That's what the FBI should be focusing on. <laughs> That's the real crime. Don't sell me a bag that makes me look like an idiot. By the way, did you notice how Delta suddenly said it was going to change this rule only after they learned that flight attendants are trying to form a union? Yeah. Interesting timing. Hmm? Yeah, it was like, it was like that Marjorie Taylor Greene moment. Oh, 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 you mean that, a union, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing scares these giant airlines more than unions. Like, if someone yelled bomb in an airport and someone else yelled union, <laughs> they honestly wouldn't know who to tackle first. <laughs> And I'm gonna give these flight attendants a lot of credit because let me tell you something, man. People fly all the time, you see these people working hard, but I didn't know that they weren't getting paid while the play, you did, I didn't know that. They're really patient people. If I was working for free <laughs> during the whole boarding process, I would have been way less friendly than, yo, I would have been in that airport like. Hey, hey, zone one, zone one. Get the hell up on the plane right now. Yo, I swear, I swear, if any of you broke ass Zone 4 is even trying to get in the line right now, I will have the TSA waterboard your ass. Get back, Zone 4. Sit down. You know who you is. That's why I can't work in that All right, finally, let's talk about COVID-19. It's the only one of us that's seen Kamala Harris in like three months. <laughs> As we all know, a little over two years ago, a bat in China didn't cover its mouth when it sneezed in a lab after visiting a food market, and that started a pandemic. <laughs> and the world has never been the same. But now, Anthony Fauci, America's most renowned infectious disease scientist and most ready for retirement human, has come out with some news that has left people shook. 
Listen to this Dr. Anthony Fauci telling PBS News that America is out of the pandemic phase. We are certainly right now in this country out of the pandemic phase. Namely, we don't have 900,000 new infections a day and tens and tens and tens of thousands of hospitalizations and thousands of deaths. We are at a low level right now. We're not going to eradicate this virus. If we can keep that level very low and intermittently vaccinate people, and I don't know how often that would have to be, but right now we are not in the pandemic phase in this country. Woohoo! The pandemic phase is over, people! The pandemic phase is over. Oh my God, I'm so happy. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Man. Oh man, I've been waiting for this moment since March of 2020. Do the balloon drop, yeah! Oh. Oh, wait, these are... Oh man, they're supposed to be like fully inflated, but I... We blew them up in April 2020. We We thought it was only gonna be a few weeks, but I guess uh, things are tough. There's just like, are there still air inside these things? There's still air inside, yeah? Yeah, there, oh. What is that, COVID? Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, Fauci says America is no longer in a pandemic phase, which is cool, but don't let these balloons fool you. It doesn't mean we're out of the pandemic. A lot of people actually misinterpreted this news today. They were like, the pandemic is over. Time to tongue kiss my grandmother again. <laughs> Man, time to tongue kiss my grandson again. <laughs> They're a very loving family. But that's not what this means. What Fauci was saying is that America is currently not in a pandemic phase, as in not in a pandemic right now, but it's not over. It could come back or it could go away, but it could come back (laughs) or go, you don't know. Yeah, it's a phase. It's sort of like wide leg jeans. They disappeared for 20 years (laughs) and now suddenly, Everyone looks like that to borrow a pair of pants from Shaq, you know? But as much as you wanna get angry at people, here's the thing, Dr. Fauci, how did you not know? How do you not know by now how stupid people are, huh? We're all stupid, you can't just say pandemic phase is over. Oh, when you say that, all we hear is party time. (laughs) I feel like that's been the major failure of this pandemic, is that the scientists have been communicating directly with the public without somebody to interpret what they're saying. That's bound to cause chaos. Right? We don't understand scientists speak. It's the reason God didn't speak directly to the people. He always went through a messenger, you know? He was like, Noah, soon I will purge the land of all sin and vice, so henceforth abundance may spring forth, and whence there was squalor, things will change. And Noah was like, I right, gotcha. Hey, yo, grab a giraffe, shit's about to get wet. <laughs> now we understand. Afghanistan. For months now, we have known that the Biden administration completely botched the exit of American troops from America's longest war. Yeah, even the Game of Thrones guys were like, woof, rough ending. But now for the first time, we're learning the details of how costly this mistake actually was. We do have some news, CNN reporting this morning that the U.S. left behind $7 billion worth of military equipment in the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan last year. That equipment now in the hands of the Taliban. What kind of equipment is it? According to the report, a few details, aircraft, munitions, military vehicles, weapons, communications gear. A lot of it it requires very precise maintenance to remain usable. They don't know if the Taliban have been able to keep all of this stuff running. That's That's a key question that they may never get an answer to. They left $7 billion worth of military equipment in Afghanistan. How is that even possible? Like, because I get anxiety leaving a hotel in a hurry, you know? (laughs) I get that, you know, like when you're rushing and then you forget your toothbrush? But let me tell you something, if I left $7 billion worth of toothbrushes, (laughs) we're turning this Uber around, people, we're going back. (laughs) Now, according to the people who left the stuff behind, and this, this part was really interesting, they say this might not be an issue because they say the Taliban might not be able to operate this stuff anyway because of how complicated it is. And first of all, I feel like they're just saying that to cover their ass. Second of all, how are they gonna act like the Taliban doesn't have YouTube? You can find anything on YouTube. (laughs) Anything. 
You're telling me only Americans can use this equipment, but the Taliban can't? They're acting like to turn the tank on, you have to sing, say, sing like the theme song to Friends, you know? You just gotta be like, come on guys, you gotta get the claps right. It's not working, what's happening? <laughs> Here's my question, here's my question. America never has the money for anything, right? There's not enough money for healthcare, there's not enough money for education, there's not enough money to finally finish the Washington Monument by putting two balls on it, but... <laughs> America has no problem with leaving behind seven billion dollars worth of weapons? How come that never happens any other way? Like, just once, I would love to turn on the news and hear something like, this just in, the government has too much money for healthcare. So, everyone gets a free butt lift. <laughs> it's mind boggling, people. It's mind boggling how much money America wastes on the military. And don't let them trick you into saying like, oh no, it goes to the troops, because it doesn't go to the troops, right? The troops are not balling in the club, no. The defense contractors is where the money goes. And then you hear these people like, well, we need to spend that money to keep people safe. But let me ask you this. What's more threatening to people in America? A group of rebels in some foreign country or healthcare nobody can afford, toxic drinking water, poverty, pollution? Because if I was America, I would spend my war money on the biggest threats. Yeah, that's what I would do. And then I would send the Taliban Flint's old water pipes. That's how I'd fight. <laughs> you don't need missiles, just send that shit. Yeah, try drinking now. <laughs> All right, but let's move on to England, the world's number one exporter of Benedict Cumberbatches. <laughs> As you may know, UK Parliament can be a pretty rowdy place. You know, every day people are shouting and booing at each other like the crowd at the world's pastiest rap battle. But it turns out that there is something that you're not allowed to do on the floor, as one British politician found out. The Conservative Party has launched an investigation into claims by some of its female MPs that a Tory colleague watched porn on his mobile phone in the House of Commons itself. Who is the Tory MP accused of watching pornography in the Commons? We still don't know, but government ministers have lined up today to condemn him, saying there's no place for pornography in any workplace. The MP could be suspended and thrown out of the Conservative Party. And the story has reignited criticism of the overall culture in Parliament. A member of the UK's Conservative Party was caught watching porn during a session. And now he could be expelled for it. And I'll be honest, I'm just trying to understand the motivation here. <laughs> no, no, like, like what part of Parliament made this guy want to watch porn? Like, what, what, what turned him on? Was there some new legislation that was getting him hot? You know, was there some other minister who was like, this country is going deeper and deeper into debt. We cannot pull out at this point. And just like, ooh, oh boy, oh boy. And you know, if you ask me, kicking him out wasn't the right punishment, man. What they should be doing is what parents do when they catch a kid smoking cigarettes. Yeah, they should force him to watch all of Pornhub. <laughs> I'll teach him a lesson, he'll be like, oh, I've seen all the categories I didn't know existed, please. Oh, who knew Congress had cocaine orgies? Oh, it's too much, Mitch McConnell. Oh, oh, oh. I like that you saw him in your mind. That was funny. <laughs> One of you was like, ah, oh, I saw it, Trevor. I mean, look, I, I get that Britain doesn't want its politicians watching porn at work, you know, but I will say, I think the one exception should be the royal family. No, I, I think porn could really open their eyes to the beauty of interracial relationships, you know? That <laughs> could be a good thing for them. Oh, and finally, and finally, if you wanna talk about politicians getting into weird trouble, and there's no better example than Donald J. Trump, 45th president of the United States and phantom of the Mar-a-Lago carving station. You see, the former president is currently being sued for inciting violence against protesters. And it's gotten serious enough that he was actually forced to testify about it. Former President Donald Trump testified under oath. He was worried that protesters would hurl things at him and that they were dangerous. As part of his deposition from back in October for a civil lawsuit in New York where activists claimed that the former president's bodyguards violently broke up protests outside Trump Tower back in 2015. Okay, first of all, it's crazy that there are so many Trump scandals that he's literally getting dragged into court for something we didn't even know was a thing. Like, did you know this was a thing? Huh, did you? 
You, nobody knew, nobody knew about this. I didn't. Trump lawsuits are like Nicolas Cage movies. There's like a bunch where you're like, he lost a pig? When did that happen? <laughs> but anyway, Trump was being sued for inciting violence to protesters, right? Against protesters, rather. And then he came up with one of the most crazy defenses I've ever heard. This might be my favorite story of the year. And to fully understand the story, you have to hear the actual deposition that Trump gave in the case. Now, unfortunately, there's no recording. But fortunately, there is a transcript. <laughs> so to give you a little taste, uh, I'm gonna get some help from our very own Michael Costa, everybody. For your uh, understanding and enjoyment, Costa and I are going to read sections from the transcript for you. Now, he will be reading the parts of various lawyers, and I will be playing Donald Jackfruit Trump. <laughs> and again, we're just gonna read excerpts from the actual transcript, because I promise you, no comedy writer is gonna come up with something funnier than this. <laughs> All right, are you guys ready? Ready? <laughs> so, so, just so you understand, the key section begins with lawyers playing a video from a 2016 Trump rally. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Knock the crap out of them, would you? That was your statement. Oh yeah, it was very dangerous. We were threatened. <laughs> with what? They were gonna throw fruit. We were threatened, we had a threat. How did you become aware that there was a threat that people were gonna throw fruit? We were told, we were told. And you get hit with fruit, it's no, it's very violent stuff. We were on alert for that. Mm. A tomato is a fruit after all, I guess, it has seeds. It's worse than a tomato. It's other things also, but tomato. When they start doing that stuff, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous stuff. You can get killed with those things. I wanted to have people be ready because we were put on alert that they were gonna do, they were gonna do to fruit. And some fruit is a lot worse than, tomatoes are bad by the way, but it's very dangerous. No, I wanted them to watch. They were on alert. They were gonna hit, they were gonna hit hard. Mm. Do, do you have any knowledge as to whether or not anybody was found to have tomatoes in their possession on that date? I don't know. But it didn't happen. It worked out that nothing happened. We heard it was gonna happen, but nothing happened. Mr. President, is it your expectation that if your security guards see someone about to throw a tomato that they should knock the crap out of them? Well, a uh, tomato, a pineapple, a lot of other things they throw, they have to be aggressive in stopping that from happening because if that happens, you can be killed if that happens. And getting aggressive includes the use of physical force. To stop somebody from throwing pineapples, tomatoes, bananas, stuff like that, yeah, it's dangerous stuff. I have no further questions. And scene. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our two-man show, The President and the Fruits, will be uh, <laughs> off Broadway soon. Again, that conversation rarely happened <laughs> with the former President of the United States. I, I will say this, he's not wrong about being hit with a pineapple being dangerous, you know? I mean, that's got spikes built in. And a banana, too. It might not seem dangerous, but remember, if someone throws a banana, it comes right back at them, so it can just throw it at you, keep hitting you over and over again. You know what I think the worst fruit is to get hit with? A honeydew. Yeah, no, not because it's hard, just because you could get some of it in your mouth, and that shit is disgusting. <laughs> like, I hope it hits me in the head and kills me so I don't have to taste it. That's what I hope for. <laughs> but no, people, this is serious stuff, and it's actually caused the Secret Service to alter their methods. I'm told that we've obtained a classified training video that shows how Secret Service protesters are now going to be dealt with. And here's some of the new training. Incredible. 
Really incredible. Before we go, I just wanted to remind you that nearly 4,000 homes have been destroyed and more than 40,000 people have been displaced by the floods and the mudslides in my home country, South Africa. Now, Gift of the Givers is a South African-based disaster relief organization on the ground helping those who have been affected by the floods. So if you can help them in their work in any way, then please donate at the link below.